Hello, and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine, and I'm joined now by Seb stafford Blore. Hello, Joe Devine. Seb, it's just you and I today, isn't it? Sure is. No Alex today, I'm afraid. We had fun. Alex is still unavailable. Alex has moved a house. There you go. He's finally moved out of his parents' house uh, as nearly 40 years old. Uh, so we've, we're all um, naturally supporting him in this move, and he just needed a couple of days to learn where how the kettle works and how things like the hob works. His mother was very keen that he didn't burn the house down straight away. Uh, so, of course, uh, he has our full support and as much time as he needs. But he will be back uh, for a Tuesday's podcast. So we'll look forward to hearing all about what kind of noodle-based meals he's been trying to make for himself <laughs> and uh, whether he's managed to wash his clothes yet or if he's uh, still still doing it naked. That's it for the introduction. I hope you uh, enjoy today's episode. Thanks for downloading it. And, uh, oh, I leave you in the uh, the warm hands and the cool, cool, cool embrace of Seb stafford Blore. And that's why you have a man lying down behind the wall, Seb. Juventus 3, 2 Porto, but 4-4 four, four on aggregate, and Porto go through. Uh, is this the best game you've seen in a long time? It's the best game I've seen this week. It was ruined really? a little bit by how passive-aggressively you typed that line about man behind the wall into the pod plan. You did it in capitals and what? bold. I just put, and that's in capitals, so I would remember to go, and that's why... But, I mean, this is the best game I've seen in a really long time. What was the best game you saw the week before? I really enjoyed Gladbach Leipzig. Oh, you're watching all you sorts of football. You know, actually, what the best I'm moment in watching. this game was is when, early on when I spotted that Juan Cuadrado was chewing gum and I texted you to, to, to kind of alert you to that, you know, thing that you were going to have to encounter and overcome. And then you sent me a picture back showing that you had already written that into your notes. That was my <laughs> Yes, because he was <laughs> chewing gum. Stop chewing gum. It's so dangerous. I'm afraid for people. I was taught as a young child. I was born with the cord around my neck. Does that, do you think that's... Anyway, there were some great performances in this game. It was very exciting. I've, I've listed some people here. Pepe, yeah? Sergio Oliveira. Uh, how do you say his name? Uh, Marchesine? Marchesine, I think. Chiesa, Quadrado, apart from the chewing the gum. And uh, Corona, I thought, also had a, had a fantastic game. Um, but let's start with Pepe. Uh, and also, former Newcastle player, Chancel and Bemba, because together, they completely dominated Porto's box alongside the keeper, didn't they, Seb? It was really active defending as well, Joe. Really physical and, um, yeah, proactive is probably the right word. And actually, we, we were talking about this yesterday. Juve started quite well. They had a good sort of five minutes at the beginning. They obviously came into the ascendancy after they went a man up or Porto went a man down. But even so, the standard and quality of the defending, it wasn't just like, you know, um, taking rising half volley, uh, volleys and the balls type defending. It was really structured and organised and satisfying. It feels like it feels almost like a shame that, um, that, that Alex isn't here to... Yeah, he loves Porto. He was he very much enjoyed their performance in the first leg too. A funny thing for me about Pepe, and I know it's something we've seen in many games of him before playing for Real Madrid and, and since playing for Porto, but he just seems to always be in the right place. I don't know, like the ball is lofted in and I can't couldn't count the number of crosses that Juve attempted in this game. Um possibly because the first five minutes they were actually they came up very, very strong. Um Quadrado put a, a fantastic ball in which Morata uh, headed straight into the arms of the goalkeeper, but Wherever the ball was lofted in from, wherever it landed in the box, it seemed to land on Pepe's head. And I know he's got a big head, but his head isn't as big as the whole box, is it, Seb? <laughs> it's probably not. And I feel like Pepe's positioning is one of those things that's been lost in amongst his kind of the other events of his career, so his reputation. Yeah. But do you remember when? Um, do you remember when Jose Mourinho was? Real Madrid manager, and he tried to create his uh, Trivot, which was his yes. three holding midfielders in his midfield three. And he kind of pushed Pepe out of central defence into one of those roles. There was a reason why he did that, because positionally he's really, really excellent. I mean, in that particular example, he was kind of pushed up the field to be an absolute shithouse and to just kick people. But, but that notwithstanding, he, uh, 
he reads the game so well, and there's a reason why he's had the career he has. Yeah, I guess uh, being a good defender is a lot about just standing in the right place. And I suppose if you've played, was he 38 years old? Uh, if you've played hundreds and hundreds of games like he has, you probably get used to or expect where depending on where the ball's being kicked from where it might end up in the box i imagine there's a kind of instinctive maths to it yes i mean <laughs> just experience isn't it <laughs> yeah it's called instinctive maths instinctive um, maths i mean that's that's almost special lions caliber rhetoric I, I, wrote, probably, but... I wrote this for alex but he's not here uh, the game started with both teams lining up in a 4-4-2, which I can imagine probably isn't. I was going to try and find the last Champions League fixture in which that happened, and then I thought better of it because I thought maybe actually it's more recent than I think it is, and also it'll take me fucking ages. Uh, and very quickly within the game, it became obvious that neither team was really <laughs> was really playing a 4-4-2. It seemed that uh, Juve, I mean, Juve had players all over the place, and uh, Porto, uh, pretty much as soon as they scored the penalty, they started playing a 6-3-1 out of possession. And it it proved like remarkably difficult for Juve to do anything about. Even after the red card, when it was just a 6-3, Juve uh, was still you know trying to loft balls in from the wings because there wasn't really any space to play inside. You could see the wingers dropping back and the, the, the back four was so narrow. There was just no space to do anything anything was there I, I mean I know Porto for the next leg Sergio Oliveira will be uh, will be suspended due to yellow card he picked up in this game but nobody's going to want to draw Porto even even without their, their sort of star player really stubborn I felt like the moment which summed up the night happened actually in the first half when I think Ronaldo picked up the ball and he might have been about 40 yards from goal and he had eight Porto players between him and the goalkeeper and it was just really interesting to see because he's he's kind of, I, I forget who, but somebody uh, on Twitter said he's reached that stage of his career where he kind of has to be wheeled into position like a siege gun and just, you know, fired. And given, I kind of agree, and maybe not quite that dramatic, I, I still think he's pretty athletic, but to see him roaming the pitch like a, a kind of, like the younger version of himself to try and influence the game was really, really telling because it just said that there was just no, there was no space for him really to do anything. Um, and he was it's, it's it's still even though he's obviously towards the end of his career now it's really interesting to see him being so peripheral in a game of that of that magnitude in a, 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 against an opponent who let's be fair Juventus should be dominating Juventus are we can talk about Porto and, and what Porto will do in the rest of the competition Juventus across those two games are a crushing disappointment just in yeah. how little they created but also forget that the, the lack of rhythm in their football. There was never really a point until the red card happened in the second game where they had any momentum across either of those matches. And that's a really damning indictment of a team that, well, has been put together at considerable cost. I mean, if you look at the players available to not just Perlo, but Sarri last season as well, like you look at what their output has been in Europe, it's incredibly disappointing. Yeah, I mean, sticking with Ronaldo, he, he was, as you say, he was pretty ineffectual within the game. Um, he provided the assist for Chiesa's first goal, but that was kind of just a very quick layoff and right place, right time, I suppose. But he seemed really off the pace. And I don't know, I, I feel a bit like, uh, obviously we'll come to talk about PSG and, and, and Barcelona as well and Messi's performance there, but it's it's tempting for me to, to compare the two. They both went out of the competition at this stage. Uh, I think I've written down in the pod plan later on, uh, if Ronaldo and Messi were candles on birthday cakes, Ronaldo's went out with the whimper of a child with a lung disease, but Messi's needed the uh, the reserve function on the handheld vacuum cleaner. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> sort of, yeah. You didn't have to blow very hard, did you? <laughs> you know, it's, it, with Ronaldo, it's amazing how he's managed to retain his surliness. So if, if you're playing with Ronaldo and you miss hit a cross by a metre or... You know, you, you, you force him to check his stride or to, um, you know, turn back on himself. Like, no matter how he ages and no matter how his powers wane, like, the body language that greets that kind of moment is still the same, isn't it? You still get that kind of hand on hips and that. It just, can you imagine being the player that's on the receiving end of that kind of gesture? It just it must be so dispiriting. It would be annoying. Also, there was a moment in the game, I wrote down this, uh, because we 
let's let's talk about um, Federico Chiesa now as well because he, okay. he scored he scored uh, Juve's uh, two goals. He was uh, he was a menace on the wing. He caused a lot of problems for Corona and uh, Manafra on that side. Uh, Twelve goals and seven assists in all competitions so far this season. We're going to talk about his his dad. Uh, but before we do that, there was a moment in the game where he tried something. I think that uh, left uh, Alexandra behind him in a bit of a vulnerable position, and then Sandro shouted at him afterwards. And I know Sandro is the, is the sort of is the more senior player there, and and it's absolutely fine, of course, for defenders to shout at attackers if they're, you know, not not providing the the, the correct cover. But I remember thinking, if I was Chiesa, that would really I would struggle with that. That would challenge my ego because I'm thinking I'm the only reason we're even in this fucking game. Like I've scored uh, one incredible goal, another very necessary goal, and now I've got some left back shouting at me because. I messed up in one in one moment, and it felt it feels a little bit like that, doesn't it? It feels like even though within this specific game there was a clear, uh, actual manifested hierarchy in terms of uh, performances, that uh, that one's still kind of ignored in favour of the uh, the the uh, social hierarchy, which uh, I suppose Chiesa isn't quite as high in. No, I suppose not, and also Chiesa's come into that Juve team at a time when their, their dominance of Serie A is waning. They're clearly not going to win the competition this year. And I suppose oh, across his career, Sandro just is the more decorated player. But it's it's funny, isn't it? It's one of the benefits, and I use that word kind of loosely, one of the benefits of Corona times with football is that you get to hear these kind of th- these little interactions on the pitch. And not just the shouting and the kind of the my ball and man on and switch it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the way players actually talk to each other, I'm thinking of that, that moment between Harry Maguire and Marcus Rashford. Um, yeah, yeah. The other night where you just think it's the same thing like if you're rash you just turn around and go fuck off like I just yeah sort sort out your own part of the side yeah i'm marcus you know? rashford you're also like alexandra right yeah but you're part of a team you're part of a unit of this team that's conceded three goals in what 98 minutes to porto yeah. fuck off <laughs> yeah and i'm the only reason goals. this is going to go to extra time so yeah i mean the extra time the extra time was so much fun because the game was already a bit bitty anyway, but in extra time, it just descended into people launching their bodies at each other. And I, I, I tweeted at the time saying, like, I'd love to know, not complaining at all, because it was very entertaining, but I'd love to know how much of that 30 minutes was actually played, because it felt like every three passes there was a foul. Somebody was pushing somebody over. Like, it was all very cynical. Uh, there were players complaining at the referee the whole time. Uh, it, the extra time was uh, was was mayhem, and uh, of course, 115 minutes into the game, Sergio Oliveira's free kick is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I was in my house, and I think I may have woken up my partner who was asleep at that time. Uh, but I was in the house watching the game on my own, on, on my computer with my headphones, and uh, it, I wasn't expecting it to go. He's so far away. He was so far away, Seb. And he then walked about as far away as the ball was from the goal for his, his really long run up. Uh, under the wall. Oh, so good. I think I went like, ha, 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 ha. I made that kind of noise as it was happening. Uh, I just, <laughs> I loved it. And then on the replay, when you watch it and you can see that it goes through Ronaldo's legs, who turns around. I think that's, uh, you know, to come back to what you were saying before about the body language being there, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the negativity when any, when anybody else uh, does something that isn't 100% efficient, which is fine. I'm not 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 a criticism of that because I understand that competitive players want to challenge each other and, that, and that's fine. But um, it must be hard to take, right? Not only to turn around in the wall when the ball's so far away from you already, uh, but to turn around, open your legs and let it go through and then presumably just watch it go through from the other side. Uh, it was very funny for me. I've got a a little bit of a bone to pick with the TV director from that night. So that Uh moment happens. Uh Now, as a viewer and as a neutral, there are a couple of things I want to see. Like, Obviously, I want to see Porto's celebration. I want to see a close-up of Ronaldo's sad little face. And then, then, why am I not seeing Andrea Agnelli and his sad little face as well, given the events of the previous few days? Surely that's the way it happens. Like that's that's kind of that's broadcasting 101. It's a it's I come from the land of Schadenfreude now. This is what I want. I want to see the effect it's had on people that I've been rooting against all evening. No? Yeah, maybe you should be the local TV director, right? <laughs> maybe you're thinking you're thinking on another level there, Seb. Also, that would be um, I always feel that those uh, those cuts are not particularly subtle, are they? It's the sort of thing that uh, you th- you think might get someone in trouble. 
they thought that maybe like you know if you if you if you show Agnelli in that situation maybe you get cut out of the new broadcasting deal. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe kinda, you know that gets remembered. Maybe you're not welcome to the new world. The time. As we said though, Sergio Oliveira unavailable for the for the following game. Um, we don't know that the, the the draw is next Friday, so we won't be able to talk about it for a couple of weeks. But I've just um, listed uh, the number of teams that are that are left in. In fact, tell you what, we'll come back to that later because we'll talk about that in relation to PSG as well. Um, f- but as I said, for me, I, I, I was a bit worried about this part of the podcast because watching that game, I had so much fun. I remember thinking, like, I don't know how we can possibly do it justice or make it as much fun as watching the game. If you didn't watch it. Uh, at least watch the highlights because it's um, it was just it, it, for me it kind of it just had everything it had all it had all of the drama it had obviously some lovely goals uh, some fantastic performances on both teams it had a, a lot of uh, narrative arcs throughout one my favorite probably including Quadrado who in the first five minutes of the game you're watching you're thinking well this guy's the best player on the pitch like he's he's going to be the way that Juve unlock this Porto side with his crossing and you often would find him on both both flanks uh, and he was uh, determined and, and gritty and he eventually was substituted. Uh, as the game drew on, he just became less and less effective and more and more irritated <laughs> and his great tackles turned into quite bad fouls and his uh, brilliant crosses turned into, you know, crosses that just hit Pepe's forehead over and over and over again. Uh, and to watch, you know, this is this is one thing I love about football is watching a particular player and watching the way that emotionally they evolve throughout the game, <laughs> and it's 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 uh, it's fun to say that I think Quadrado totally um, uh, uh, sim- uh, symbolised Juve in that in that game. Started started strong first five minutes and just were worn worn down and broken and ground to dust by this uh, immovable object that is Porto. Yeah, I mean. I mean that's that's not quite descriptive of you the way that you viewed that game and the kind of the disintegration of a player, a human being, really sure. in that situation. Sure, well, everything's <laughs> descriptive, isn't it? I wanted, I kind of wanted to talk about the red card incident and the uh, yeah. sequence of events which led up to it, which I didn't care for. No, nor did I. You go first. Okay, let's caveat this by saying that this is nothing new, and we've all seen it many, many times before. I think without the crowds and without stadium ambience, you notice the ugliness a little bit more. I can understand that reaction when there's been a particularly egregious foul. So, you know, say, um, you know, two-footed challenge uh, on the kneecap. I can understand the human response of players that crowd the referee and want justice for their teammate. I get that. But silly moment that was, you shouldn't be kicking the ball away like that. You are inviting a referee to make a decision. It's just really ugly to see eight players surround the referee begging him to send off another player. It's just really, I mean, it's also it's just, for it's, kind of stupid rule. I mean, I understand why it's a rule, but uh, yeah. I, I was legitimately thinking over the weekend watching the Premier League games that the ball is repeatedly being kicked away, albeit a little more subtly than the way um, that it was done in this game. It's not punished anymore. It, it, it was punished a lot uh, in the first season that that, that rule was brought in. I think to try and you know set the standard, and what's happened is the players have evolved and adapted to the point where they just sort of subtly kick the ball away, and they they create space between the uh, the free kick zone and the ball by doing uh, sneaky little things like accidentally kicking it or kicking or it picking softly, the ball yeah. up and running away with it, but then yeah, putting it down it back. Like twenty meters away. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, so we, we can appreciate that. Um, the I'm trying to remember uh, which player it was that. Um, oh yes, it was Taremi. That's right. Yeah, he smacked it obviously into Rosette of the stadium. So uh, you know, it would, I'm not particularly defending the decision to do that or even the decision to send, to send him off. What I did see from the you know the TV director, at least from my, my perspective of the game, was a uh, Ronaldo uh, screaming in the referee's face until the referee uh, made this uh, incredible uh, uh, sign <laughs> by putting his fingers in his ears and staring like he, at Ronaldo like he was going to murder him. Uh, Ronaldo quickly turned around, uh, almost just in time to not be caught doing this by the TV cameras, uh, and you know walked away slowly, perhaps already knowing that the uh, the game was won. You know, what I suppose that the 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 ultimate justice here is that um, you know Juve had spent by that point. What was this? It was just like around half time, wasn't it? No, just after half time. Just after uh, half time. By that point, they'd spent you know over uh, I don't know 120 minutes trying to 
score goals <laughs> against Porto, trying to get some kind of uh, dominance or get to grab some kind of hold of the game. And then even after Porto had a, a man sent off, they remained unable to. I think that's the kind of one of the things that made this game fun to watch and one of the things that, you know, uh, I don't know, it gave, it gave me some joy. Because as you say, the way in which that the way in which that happened is distasteful. It's not pleasant to watch. It makes me think of cheating, even though I guess it's technically not. Uh, it's it's everything you hate about those, you know, children at school, right? When the red card happens, you kind of know what's going to happen next. So I would have had my money on a Ronaldo penalty, sort of 88, 89 minutes, because that's just how football works. Basically, yeah. you you know the big the big team that you're rooting against perseveres somehow, and yada yada yada, etc. What you rarely see is a team surviving that long with ten men away from home uh, against such a powerful opponent, um, and, a, and a team who seem to have the momentum by that stage. And so it's kind of nice. It's, it's Chelsea just a, Barcelona, isn't it? It's a little bit Chelsea Barcelona. Yeah, very good comparison. Exactly that because you think you've had your your John Terry moment, just a moment of gross stupidity, which yeah. I still haven't heard an explanation for, really. Um, and then yet somehow, even despite the fact that no, none of the energy in the game is flowing towards that particular result, somehow it still happens. And it's, it's novel. It's just like, it's nice when football surprises you. And I think that's why, like you've already mentioned, like as a spectacle, as a footballing spectacle, extra time wasn't great. It was just, it was, it was just nasty. It was as, it was as entertainment. The, it was though. Yeah, it was entertainment, but it was entertainment in a kind of like Roman gladiatorial sense. It was just like right into the ring, into into the Colosseum you go, and just uh, just have a scrap, see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so Fuck there was up. this kind of it was like a quite a primal experience watching it because. I suppose you'd say Porto survived somehow. And even their goal, it was scrappy. Ronaldo turns his, turns his back. Chesney should save it. Um, you know, Chesney dropping yeah. a bollock in a big game. Who would have thought? Um, mm-hmm. and, and it has all these really pleasing elements that football tends not to reward you with all in one go at the same time. Also, it's a kind of that's what you get moment. You know, to go back to that red card, right? Uh, they've had 120 minutes to do anything against Porto, a team that has significantly less money and has, uh, you know, significantly less star power and uh, significantly less uh, reason to be at this stage in the Champions League. And you're against a, a team that, you know, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, like you wish the camera had cut to Agnelli afterwards, right? You see Ronaldo, one of the best players in the world, is there. There's all the money that's been spent on this team and they can't break them down, mate. It's funny. It's funny. It's like, fuck you. You know, now you're all hounding the ref to try and get one of their lesser players sent off so that you have more of a chance of winning. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It made me feel like that. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you ever feel like that? I do feel a little bit like that. I felt uh, I felt like our, our good friend, our good buddy, Nick Miller, summed up the mood. So after the game, he tweets, uh, new Champions League proposals from Andrea Agnelli. No away goals in games played in Turin. Portuguese <laughs> clubs banned. Dutch ones too. Oh, and French yeah. ones, definitely French ones. Yeah, 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 definitely Teams wearing French. black and white receive automatic buys. Last point, must have at one point owned Fiat to compete. See, this is the beauty of football, right? And this is why, you know, at its core, uh, a European Super League or any kind of system whereby, uh, you know, some of the rumours we've heard recently about Champions League level clubs not being able to nick players off each other or any of this... Uh, nonsense uh, of uh, of uh, leagues not including relegation or promotion like this this game and its evidence is is, is what we see is that it, for personally for me is the beauty of football it is exactly this kind of thing happening is when you have the opportunity for uh, and no disrespect to Porto but definitely a lesser club beating or th- theoretically a lesser club uh, beating uh, you know Juventus in a week like this uh, in the manner in which they did. I just think that particular narrative is one of the most attractive to me. It's one of the things that attracts me most to football. Uh, and uh, any kind of scenario in which that is unavailable uh, is a bullshit scenario and shouldn't be considered. Hello, listeners. Sorry to interrupt your show, but we've got a small favour to ask. We're currently doing a bit of a survey to find out more about you, your podcast listening habits, and the sort of adverts that are most relevant to you. If you feel like helping, please head to surveymonkey.com slash r slash athletic audio UK. That's pretty catchy, so I'll say it one more time. Surveymonkey.com slash r slash athletic audio UK. Thank you. And almost as if it was planned, uh, we're going to talk now. Well, Seb's going to talk now to uh, 
to Matt Slater of The Athletic. Uh, and Matt talked about the proposed reforms, some of the ones that we're discussing now, the shape of what the Champions League from 2024 onwards will look like, uh, and some extra detail on the, the banning transfers between uh, the Champions League clubs remark that uh, we were just mentioning there too. So uh, enjoy this chat with Matt, and we'll be back afterwards to talk about PSG Barcelona, uh, maybe a little bit on the Barcelona elections. <laughs> Right, we are going to talk about Champions League reform and Andrea Agnelli and Andrea Agnelli's effect on Champions League reform. And to do that, we've got Matt Slater. Matt, what is happening to the Champions League and what is it going to do to football shape in the future? Blimey. Well, there's a couple of big questions. We'll do the, we'll do the first half of that because uh, it's a bit easier. Uh, yeah, um, as, as our listeners may be aware... Um, yeah, there have been talks about changing the Champions League again uh, for a few years now. The Champions League is really a, a an evolving beast. You know, go go way back. It used to just be champions in a straight knockout. And then in the mid-90s, it went to this kind of league format where you started to bring in non-champions and it's grown and we've got group stages and they adapt it every few years. It's actually been pretty set for a while now. And some might say it's overdue a tweak. Others will say no, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, mm. But that's you know we don't we don't leave things alone. If you do, they do tend to sort of drift. So uh, the big clubs are absolutely um, adamant and have been for some time that the opportunity that presents itself, uh, season 2024 20, 25, is one they need to grasp, and that's because that is when the current broadcast commercial contracts run out, the current, you know, the cycle runs out and there is a sort of opportunity to have another look. So people may have read and heard various ideas. I won't do the whole full history of the ideas. There've been some radical ones that have been floated and then shot down. And there was a big fight in 2019 about a really radical idea. The idea that has kind of emerged is this Swiss model. So the Swiss model, it was apparently first suggested by ex Man United goalkeeper Ajax CEO Edwin van der Sar, um, maybe a chess fan because it's very common in chess tournaments, and it's this. It's basically a, a a solution for when you have a really large number of potential entrants, and you don't want to do uh, loads and loads of like head-to-head -head knockouts. You want to kind of put them in a league that kind of makes sense. So basically. It's very scalable. Not everyone has to play everybody, but you have a coherent table. So for our purposes, the Champions League will grow from 32 that make the group stages, the current um, the current groups we have, the eight groups of four, and we'll go to 36 teams, so four extra places, but they won't play um, home and away against everyone. They will. They, the proposal is they will play 10 games, five at home, five away, not necessarily against the same teams. In fact, it won't be against the same team. So 10, they'll, they'll play 10 other teams. Um, and then you get, you know, you get that increase of the six guaranteed group stage games they have now to 10 guaranteed games. And then in that table, which would be kind of sort of seeded and you do, you know, you do, you know, everyone arranged from one to 36, the top eight after those 10 group stage games will progress to the current round of 16 we've got. And uh, they will play the winners of playoffs between the teams that come ninth and 24th. So, you know, ninth would play 24, 10 would play 23, six, which actually are two legs, uh, or perhaps not to be discussed, but I think they want two legs. Uh, and there you then have it as we have now. A few things still to be ironed out, but that's, that's the format. And then we would have the Europa League as now. And we would have this Europa Conference League, which is actually starting next season. We, that's already decided um, the, the third competition, if you like, going back to the days of the, the Cup Winners' Cup when we used to have three European competitions. So, so there's, there's your format. 36-team uh, revamped Swiss model league-style Champions League, Europa League, Europa Conference League. Uh, those four extra places for the Champions League. Again, there's a little bit of a row, a little bit, you know, still to be decided here. Uh, do they go to four champions of, you know, the eighth, ninth, tenth best leagues in Europe? Or do they get kind of carved out and reserved for your Liverpools and Spurs and, you know, any any kind of 
big beast that might be struggling to qualify based on sort of historic performance in Europe over the last five years. I think there's going to be a compromise there. I think there might be an extra champion, you know, thrown in there, whoever it might be, whoever's next in the list in the national coefficient could be Switzerland, could be could be Scotland. And then I think they will give a fourth place to the fifth best league, the top four leagues in Europe, England, Italy, Spain, Germany get four slots in the group stages. France are the current fifth best league. They get three. The idea is to give them four because they've been moaning about it for years. Funny thing is, if you actually look at the projections, Portugal are coming up hard on the rails. It could be them who actually get the fourth place. And that would be a leap from, from two places in the current system to four for the Portuguese league. So, you know, things not everything's written in stone. I think that was quite interesting. And then there'll be a big row about how you distribute the money and blah, 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 blah. We're going to get to how I feel, in inverted commas, about a lot of this in a bit. With the historic wildcard situation, so the, mm. the four new entrants, the four places um, that there's the argument over at the moment, this concept has been around for a really long time, or at least the rumours of it have been. How would this actually work? So would you have a situation potentially at the beginning of a season where... You know, someone uh, in some faceless person in some room somewhere in Europe says, don't worry, Man United, you can be awful this year. You're still going to qualify. Is that what we're looking at? Or is it a post-season decision? Or is it quite as brazen as, well, you, you know, you won a couple of European Cups 20 years ago. Therefore, you should be allowed to be in this place, in this competition for the on the basis of the size of your fan base and your revenue streams and yada, yada, yada. How, how would that actually happen? Well, not quite as brazen as that. Give them a chance. That could be like the next situation of where we go with all this. Um, <laughs> Something it's, to a, it's, a, it's a safety net, but it's not the safety net is not that generous to the big clubs. Thank God. It's based on your European club coefficient, which is uh, you earn points based over your performances in Europe over five years. So, for example, Real Madrid have got a high coefficient. Liverpool have got a high coefficient. They've won it. They went to the final. Um, you know, you kind of you, you, your perennial Champions League clubs have high coefficients. You could be like an Atalanta who weren't in Europe for a bit, but have had a couple of good seasons now. They'll be earning big points. And yeah, it's like a sort of any kind of seeding ranking system that we see in golf or tennis. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a point based ranking system. Now, the big clubs obviously make the point that they are the ones that are driving the value, right? That fans around the world want to see Bayern and Barca and Liverpool, you know, they're, that's what is creating the interest. So they should be recognised and rewarded for that. Now, the leagues go, all right, fine. But what's driving our value is the jeopardy of the race for fourth, the race for the European qualification places, whatever it is in whatever league. And if you take that away from us, well, you are diminishing us, diminishing our product. You are breaking that link between kind of recent performance and the reward being Europe. I think UEFA, because it's a UEFA proposal, but it's been very much kind of done in, in concerts, I was gonna say cahoots, but uh, with uh, the European Club Association, which <laughs> represents the big clubs, there's a compromise. And I think the compromise would be, look, if you were to come, if you were to be a, a, a giant that had a, a, an off year, uh, but uh, you've got great recent European pedigree, so you have contributed to the pot, you know, you have driven value, and it is still performance based, okay, it's not recent domestic performance but it is based on your performances in Europe over the last five years and you were to come in a European place so so if you were to come uh, fifth sixth or seventh in England right so instead of going into the Europa League or the Europa Conference there might this would be your your leg up getting back into the Champions League so that's it it's not you can come nowhere you can come 12th and because you're Liverpool or because you're I don't know Borussia Dortmund or whoever it might be or Roma um yet yeah, you can get in regardless of how you did last year because you've been so good in Europe. You, you still would have to sort of qualify for a European competition. This would just bump you up back into the Champions League. That's the suggestion. That but This debate around access is how they refer to it, is very, very um, fraught because of that issue that domestic leagues make. Well, if you take that away from us one you're making a closed system and it's going to be the same old teams we don't like that but two you're, you actually hurt our product because our product is based on 
compelling games right to the end of the season. I think I've got two major problems with this. The first is the idea that, actually Adonis and I were talking about this before we started recording, the idea that already with a fantastic financial advantage and the ability to procure players that isn't matched you know, in, in many cases by anybody else in the league. So if you think about sort of the, the top dogs in the respective leagues and the gap between the part of the mountain they inhabit and what exists beneath them, the idea that there needs to be this kind of fail-safe against gross mismanagement. Should your uh, super club be so unfortunate as to buy a lot of really, really, really expensive footballers who turn out to be absolutely crap, that you need to have a, a kind of market correction for that? I, I just hate that, obviously. The second, and you're a South End fan, aren't you, Matt? I am, yeah. You are, you are. And uh, our um, our good friend Mark Mosley is, um, is trying to pretty clear of the league two relegation zone moment. Best. he is doing his best a good man is mark good manager too anyway the idea behind football take out the champions league take out the top four take out relegate all that is this basic belief in in every dog eventually having their day aspiration you go to watch your football club not because you expect to win anything but because you think this week is going to be better than last week and the week after that is going to be even better. Probably not because most of us live in a world of perpetual disappointment with our football clubs. But that is the, the basic idea. That, that gets you going to the games. This challenges that. Okay, not quite by legislation, but almost you're creating a seal at the top of the game. You're ensuring that those teams who exist there uh, are at as little risk of dropping out of that um, kind of um, velvet roped VIP room as possible and you're saying I don't know what you're saying to everybody who who, um, who exists beneath that level I mean, yeah where, where, you're saying where, where know is... your place stay in your lane okay and that, and that brings me to probably our last point and the, the thing that um, again really troubles me um, it's not it doesn't seem to be quite on the table this time but clearly uh, Andrea Agnelli chairman of the ECA has an appetite for Banning transfers between, <laughs> between clubs who uh, are qualified for the Champions League. Is that about the size of it? Well, okay, so this is quite interesting. So um, this came out of um, the European Club Association's uh, General Assembly. They have them every now and then. I think it's every six months um, on Monday. Andrea Agnelli is the president of the ECA, but he is also, and this is really important, um, the president of Juve, you know, from the Agnelli family own Fiat and, and Ferrari and what have you. So in an answer, this is, he, had a, he had a press conference after, a video press conference afterwards, in an answer about cost controls and how the big clubs and how the industry in general has coped with COVID and the money they've lost and blah, blah, blah. He, you know, started off saying something quite interesting around um, a collective bargaining agreement, a European-wide collective bargaining agreement, the type of thing that we see in North American sport, which is basically a kind of carve-out of monopoly rule, competition law, sorry, where um, owners and players basically agree to divide the money and um, players agree to have restrictions placed upon them, but they agree to it because... Uh, these restrictions are not too onerous and there are salary caps, but crucially there are salary flaws and there are, you know, various protections put in place. And it's basically, it's just an agreement, right? So could, could Europe do that? Well, it's tricky because we are not one nation like the US. You know, there's EU competition law in there. We have different history, uh, traditions and cultures and legal systems, etc. So it's always, it's always, it's a great idea but it's complicated. So you start off musing about that, and if we have one, we'd be able to cope with these stresses and crises better. We'd have been able to, for example, you know, kind of um, lower wages last year as a temporary measure. We wouldn't have to have individually negotiated with every single player. We could have done something industry-wide in the way that other industries did, and the way lots of companies responded to the uh, crisis. So that was all fine, and it, you know, he was kind of musing at that point. But then he said, and like, you know, something else we could do, for example, we could sort of divide the teams into tiers. So tier one could be Champions League qualified teams. Tier two could be Europa League and, you know, and Europa the Conference League. And then you know, it could be everyone else. And we could say that the tier one teams, the big clubs, wouldn't be allowed to buy, to poach each other's players. Uh, and he was saying, now, now that, that could be good because it would help su sustainability. 
um, but it would also help uh, in terms of the support they send down the pyramid. Um, you know, you, <laughs> Did you say that? So, so, yeah, so, so you know, because we would then be looking at the champion players from um, teams from, you know, smaller leagues. So, you know, that could be a good thing. Now, you know, I've sort of, you know, oh, I've not heard this before. <laughs> this, 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 this ECA policy, there are all sorts of obvious flags here. Um, and he, and he had made this other point as well about, you know, if you did that, you would be avoiding the Neymar type situation where he said these triple figure in, in millions of transfer fees, because, you know, the big clubs are the only ones that can pay those sort of fees. So we'd be scrapping those. So that would be an obvious cost control. And um, yeah, you know, we, we would be sending, you know, we would be shopping at the tier below. So there would be money going that way. Now, uh, Couple issues, obviously, with that. I mean, it sounds like a cartel. <laughs> a couple, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. there are there are you know um, definite Brussels implications around that, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's all very cozy for the big clubs to sort of have a hands-off policy. But yeah, we're going to raid the tier below us. To me, you know, in those sort of environmental disaster films you see sometimes, there's a thing <laughs> that causes the extinction of life. That, <laughs> as an idea, is an extinction level policy because well, uh, that is just that is a um that alters the game forever because it, it means it, that, it has that potential um, it has that potential yeah it's that yeah. serious to me I, I i get wound up about this thing I'm, I'm generally quite dead behind the eyes in relation to most matters in the game because seeing it all before you develop cynicism as you get older this Makes me angry. Yeah. Well, it it, it it's uh, it made a few of us sort of kind of look, well think we were all on Zoom calls and Teams calls. But um, we were like, uh, have you heard this before? Well, you know. So I tweeted it and and then I went back and just double checked and I tweeted the exact verbatim quote. It, look, I got quite a bit of reaction, including for some um, people in the uh, how should I put this uh, the sort of uh, players union world. Who were saying, uh, are you, if you're going to write that, uh, I can send you a quote right now if you like. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to write it, but maybe I will. Now, uh, what I can tell you is the ECA um, phoned a few of us afterwards to to say, sometimes Andrea talks as president of the ECA, and in the same answer he might though finish as the chairman of Juve. So yeah. that has never been discussed at the ECA before. And uh, is not ECA policy. Um, however, look, the point they would then make, and I'm slightly betraying confidence here, but I, th I don't think it's a bad one, is Andrea has ideas. Is that so bad? Is it so bad to express an idea, even one that's only half thought through, and that he clearly was sort of kind of, you know, as I said, in full musing mode? Um, what, what, was he, what was he trying to achieve? So go back to the start of the answer. He was talking about cost controls. So there are elements of that answer, that idea, that do tick the cost control box. Uh, but then you start to go, well, hold on a minute, Andrea, because it would have this consequence. So yeah, it's an X. Now, does that mean that we should never express ideas? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do have some sympathy with the, with the concept that there's no such thing as a bad idea. I mean, <laughs> that, that's close. Um, the fact that that idea has very quickly been um, disowned makes me think it's not particularly real. I suppose you could, though, and this is fine, flip that and say, ah, but it reveals a mindset. You know, it, the fact that the owner of Juventus, this unbelievably privileged club that have won however many in a row it is, you know, in the year that it looks like they might not win, comes up unprompted with this type of suggestion what does that really tell you about the way these guys think that's fine you know if you if, if you want to come at it from that direction that's absolutely fine yeah i i, I think that is the way i come at it because I, I i think um i look at that and i i hear the theoretical justifications relating to sustainability but what i imagine will happen and i have absolutely no doubt is what would happen is you use it to uh, damage the negotiating of the position of players at contract time. Um, you ensure that the clubs um, protect a greater share of their revenue in addition to ensuring you know, the long-term preservation of those revenue streams by nature of the competition itself. You also ensure that anybody be below that level of the game 
uh, can never really compete with you ever again. Because can you imagine being, um, say, for instance, you were an Everton type club um, who has had a generation's worth of players plundered by the level above. And then you arrive, you know, after your elaborate game of snakes and ladders, which it would no, no doubt be to qualify for this kind of tournament. And then you arrive with this squad, which is completely unsuited to purpose, which hasn't been nourished by um, the decadent revenues from broadcasting payments from at that level above. And you can't compete. You become a minnow in that world. You become a, a San Marino going into a world of England's and Germany's and Spain's, essentially. It's something which challenges my affection for the game and my interest in the game. And it scares the hell out of me. Like, I, okay, ideas are fine. Andrea Agnelli is free to express his ideas. But at some point, you just think, can someone get hold of this guy? Because <laughs> these ideas are dangerous, Matt. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's a bad one, all right? And it, it, it's a bad one because it's a kind of non-starter, really. Um, I just don't see how that could possibly fly uh, within the European Union. Um, we're no longer in the European Union, but Turin very much is. So he's going to have a bit of an issue there. Um, you know, in the wider piece about the changes that we have been talking about with the Champions League, yeah, look, I mean, the thing that I keep coming back to is these big wealthy clubs already uh the the system's pretty much gamed in in their advantage they have huge advantages already that have been uh allowed to build up over the last 25 30 years yet yeah, we've always had big clubs small clubs of course we had you can't deny that we don't have a closed system like the nfl where everything is shared and you have engineered competitive balance we don't have that fine but the advantages that they used to have have only been uh, have only grown they have stretched and that is to do with um, the uh, injection of uefa money largely and that compounding effect every year of qualifying for europe and um, there are all kinds of things that play into this technology the fact that sort of soccer has become this kind of global product that these are international brands but everything has worked in their favor and that is why you are seeing competitive balance in domestic leagues around uh, europe been greatly diminished and that is very easy to track um, and um, yeah we have created an aristocracy we've created an elite and yet it still doesn't appear to be enough of them and that that is what kind of upsets me and, and makes me a little bit kind of oh god this lot again and whilst the key message I guess for many from yesterday's European Club Association meeting Monday's uh, meeting was look the Super League has been put to bed we're not interested in that we want to carry on working with UEFA and the Champions League and this is just the latest iteration and look don't panic change is not necessarily bad we're going to try and grow value and yes you know your Atalantas and your Leicesters the path is still there for them we're not closing the door fine fine but they still ultimately want more okay there was Matt wasn't that isn't that fun Matt's good isn't he that's excellent uh, I got a little bit emotional towards the end of that, but uh, yeah. I heard it. I heard it. That bit where you were threatening to murder. That bit, yeah. 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 I haven't listened to it. Uh, let's do PSG Barcelona now. PSG Barcelona, 1 1 on the night, 5 2 on aggregate. There were some strange moments in this game, Seb, and I want to talk about the incidents. Now, I know that's not something that we would ordinarily do, but every time I hear a broadcast presenter say, oh, I know it's boring, and no, I wish we didn't have to talk about it, but we do, I think, it's not that boring, mate. Fuck off. Let's just talk about it. So that's why we're talking about it. Uh, PSG's penalty, okay? Uh, do you, do you, have you seen the highlights of this game? Because I know you're watching Liverpool. Yeah, I watched Liverpool until about 70 minutes, and then I, I turned over. I have seen the highlights. It reminded me a little bit of um, the David Luiz moment at Molyneux. Do you remember that? Well, let me describe it for, for the listeners in case they okay. haven't seen it. Uh, because Mbappe plays the ball into the box, right? Uh, but it's straight into the arms of the keeper. And nowhere near the ball, Icardi and uh, Longley run in together uh, with Longley trailing a little bit, who clearly accidentally steps on Icardi's heel, not near the play. Uh, and upon a, a VAR review, it's given as a penalty. So technically, by the rules, it is a penalty. But the rule is stupid, Seb. The rule seems to have been messing around with the word intentional for quite a long time now, almost to the point where I don't really understand it anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess they're trying to simplify it as much as possible, right, by suggesting that whether it's intentional or not, 
if there's a trip of this kind or if there's physical contact enough to bring a player down, even if they're not involved in the play, it's a penalty. It just doesn't, like, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, Icardi has no impact on the game whatsoever. Uh, and in those sorts of situations, I'm, I'm not suggesting that if Icardi was about to tap the ball into the back of the net and there was an accidental trample on his heel that prevented that, that that wouldn't be a penalty. I'm not, I think that, that should be. But given that Icardi is not in any way impacting play, uh, and this, this kind of trip basically doesn't happen until the ball is already in the arms of the goalkeeper, it's clearly an accident. There is no reason to do this. I don't understand why why the rules can't account for for, for uh, in, intention in a scenario where a player isn't impacting the play. I mean, I, I don't really have an answer for you there. I mean, what I'd say is that there are just <laughs> referees who... Uh, they look for the opportunity to make decisions rather than making decisions based on what's actually happening, even if that kind of incident affects the game. So again, I draw the parallel to David Lewis at Molyneux because I don't think there's any intent to foul the player. There's not even an intent to move towards the ball. It's just what something that happens as a result of the two positions the player is in, the two positions the players are in. And, and also the only alternative in that scenario would have been, right, you just let the player run through on goal, which cannot be an option as a defender this instance like it's to the, me the it's thing not is, about you, you accidentally kill a human being and you still probably go to jail right yeah but if you accidentally kill a human being in a war zone <laughs> no, i don't think this is going to survive the edit. does this analogy work i don't think so, this <laughs> no, is going to survive no it doesn't no, I don't it doesn't so. hold on hold on if you accidentally kill a, a person then it is <laughs> I think we should just abandon the analogy. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do the war bit. Hold on. You see, if you accidentally kill a man, then you are you are going to go to jail, right? For, they call that manslaughter. So I think that I I don't I don't know how that helps here, but I'm just saying that is a thing, right? It's not intention isn't always a, it isn't always a necessary. You know, accidents happen and. Uh, Sometimes we all have to. Uh, sometimes life's unfair, isn't it? So I'm kind of okay with the David Louise thing. I think it's a bit. It's unfortunate for him. It's not like he meant it, um, and I get that he has to do that. But then what's happened is a, a series of movements have occurred, which have led to this moment. So you know, it's a, there's a kind of shared responsibility for it. Uh, in the Akadi, uh, a long lay incident, I think um, there's absolutely no reason that this is a penalty at all. It makes no sense whatsoever, uh, and uh, I appreciate that Akadi's hurt, but. Uh, just let's all just wait for a second and start again. Oh, not us. I meant them on the pitch. Oh, sorry. Okay, right. We've all put you. Whatever you paused there because you thought I was talking to you, didn't I? No, I was, I was saying let's wait for a cardi to get his shoe back on and then we'll start again. You know, I was I was in role as one of the players. Can you imagine if that game was closer and that was given as an 89th minute penalty in the second leg and it decided the game? Like, can well, you imagine how unsatisfying? Because yeah. presumably. Sure. What you've watched, I don't know, 180 minutes of really good football or at least dramatic football full of some of the best players in the world. And then it comes down to an official who just wants to insert himself into the storyline. I think it probably could have made a difference because uh, uh, we were texting at half time. You were watching Liverpool. I was watching this game. Um, Barcelona's penalty, which was given just before half time. Uh, wonderful save um, from from uh, King Kaylor. Uh, but... Upon review, it was very clear that Verratti was encroaching inside the D, which apparently, I didn't realise this, but apparently the D counts as the penalty area in those situations. Yep. Uh, and he's he's already at the cusp of the penalty area. So when I'm looking at it, I'm kind of thinking, oh, he doesn't, I'm not quite sure if he's inside or not. And then someone says, oh, it's the D. And I go, oh, right. <laughs> he's like two yards inside. He's really deep. He's massively encroaching. Which you think, okay, maybe it doesn't matter. He then goes on to clear the ball after the save. Uh, VAR reviews it because of a, a suspected encroachment. I think that, you know, the commentary team assumed that they were talking about Kaylor Navas, but potentially coming off his line, which he didn't. Um, I, I assume not. And uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't taken again. So like, clearly what happened there was that the VAR team just missed it or, like me, didn't know that the D counted or just hadn't noticed that, that Verratti was very clearly deep inside the area by the time the penalty was taken. Um, <clears throat> I remember texting you at half time and saying, this is Barcelona playing brilliantly. And I think if they'd scored that goal, 
I, I, they only would they only would have had to have scored two goals in the second half. Now, of course, they didn't score any in the second half as it as it happened. But I think you know we know how goals and moments can affect momentum within games, and I do believe that if Barcelona had gone in at two one uh, at half time, coming out thinking they only had to score two goals rather than you know a big challenge of trying to score three. I think there was some competition left in the game that that that, that ended up not happening. But just to your point about what if that uh, long Leicardi thing had happened in the 89th minute? Uh, what if the game was close? I, I think the game could have been close, but for a, another poor decision, even on even upon review. I was going to text it to you, and I I got half through it. But you know, sometimes you're on WhatsApp and you just think, oh, I can't be bothered. It's just too long and you know predictive, and it's a pain. So I just stopped. I thought I'll save that for the podcast. Because this was one of those things that came up at Stockley Park all those, you know, a couple of years ago. Do you remember the, the podcast we did about this? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. they spent a really long period of time around this kind of incident specifically. And as an example, they used the penalty that uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang missed in the North London derby at Wembley in, I think, 2018. Uh, when Hugo Lloris saves it down to his right, the ball comes back into the area and Jan Vertonghen... Um, clears it over the over the bar and out for a corner now their point was that there are going to be instances where players who encroach after a penalty has been taken um that offense is going to be ignored and that would be because obviously the penalty is scored or they had no involvement in what happened afterwards so say a player encroaches and then you know uh, a block is made by somebody who wasn't encroaching who was legal at the time the penalty was taken they would just allow that to take place in this instance, you're quite right. Like it's the thing that they're supposed to be checking for. And to us, it was portrayed as, right, what's happened? Who's made the clearance? Who's affected the play? Almost like a, almost like an offside in a way. Yeah. And that didn't happen. It's just, I think this is one of the, the, the bigger issues with VAR in that sometimes given all its pedantry, it seems very selective because you, you see it pouring over minuscule offside decisions for five minutes at a time. And then for the sake of an extra 10 seconds, it kind of thinks, ah, I can't be asked with that. Let's just play on. Or, or stuff like, really it give, like it doesn't review the uh, inaccurate giving of a corner uh, at a vital moment in a game when a goal is then scored, which is arguably just as important uh, as, as as an offside, particularly if it's going to result in a goal. We see that fairly often, you know, toward, in the death of a game, there's a clash of, of two opposition players in the corner. It's not really that clear to the referee who touches it last before it goes out. And uh, it's it's inaccurate, inaccurately given one way or another. That feels like a big moment, uh, but but you know the consensus is that VAR doesn't doesn't inspect those sorts of decisions, which again just leaves people feeling, I think, confused, scared, and alone. Anyway, uh, speaking of confused, scared, and alone, PSG aren't any of those things, are they? Is that a good segue? This is what we're going to have to finish. I, we, God, you know we've talked for quite a long time already, Seb. So uh, we're going to have to finish here by saying the teams left in this tournament. I'm very much looking forward to next the uh, next uh, Thursday Friday's podcast because uh, we'll be able to talk about the 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 round of 16 in full. But teams left <clears throat> Porto, Dortmund, Liverpool uh, and teams we assume will will continue Manchester City, uh, Real Madrid, uh, Bayern Munich almost certainly, one of Chelsea and Atletico that doesn't seem to be uh, that clear so far. There are no easy games left in the tournament, are there? But given that PSG made it to the final last season, given how strong they looked against uh, Barcelona in the first leg, uh, they've got a very good chance, haven't they? I think they do. The only the only side that I would uh, favour over them is probably Man City. I'm looking at that group and Porto, yeah, okay, for everything we've said about them, you, you would still, um, I think you would still favour pretty much any other team in that list ahead of them. Dortmund are very fragile, Liverpool ditto. Athletic Madrid are, uh, Atletico Madrid, sorry, are a really interesting case because you wonder the closer they get to winning the league title, how that's going to affect the allocation of their resources. Yeah. They were a little bit iffy against Bilbao um, earlier this week. A little bit had to come from behind to win. And there been some signs lately that, not nerves necessarily, but the kind of the magnitude of their task slash achievement is starting to get to them, starting to yap at their knees a little bit. Um, so we'll see. Chelsea, I don't think, are, too, are far enough into their two-call cool cycle, really. Um, I think they may, even in fact, knock out Atletico, Atletico Madrid, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure they're quite there yet. And then you're left with... You know, Bayern Munich, who are a little bit ominous, but are a little bit less uh, powerful than they were a year ago. I don't know. I, I, PSG are very well placed. Very, very well placed. 
I want a final prediction, please. You want a final prediction, but I don't know the bracket of the draw. That's not fair. I know, that's, that's, that's why it's extra But you hard. have to put that on the podcast. Yeah, but you have to put that on the podcast plan. No, I don't. I can, I can, I can see do you. whatever I want. You're on the podcast plan now. You're I'm moving asking. the cursor around. You're okay, doing that thing where you're on. trying to give me a you're, final you're trying to disrupt me. prediction. No, you can't just please. type it on now. That's it's not the on same. the all. podcast plan. I'll give you mine. Okay, but um, you know, look, it's do you no want, Do you now. want mine? Oh, you've deleted it. You've deleted it. Do you want mine? Uh, yes, I would, please. Oh, you do want mine? Yeah. Okay. I think Porto are going to make it to the final. Yeah, I think Porto are going to come up against Liverpool in the next round. And uh, I think given how, how we've seen Liverpool's struggles to score uh, against uh, defensive teams, I think Porto are going to sail through. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be Porto, Man City. And all of the narrative is going to be around uh, uh, Pep finally Pep making it to a final and overthinking it <laughs> the game. And then being God, being bored with that. Come yeah. say so. <laughs> Oh, mate, I'd love it. Yeah, and I want Phil it to Phone's go to gonna like... Play right back and it's going to be yeah, really Yeah, Phil Foden's going to be right back and it's going to go to Guero penalties. Guero is a holding midfielder. Oh, mate, it's that, that's my prediction. Now, now, very quickly before yeah. we end, I'd, I think people would love to hear yours. I like Man City to win it. I think Man City... Oh. I think Man City by Munich in the final. Okay, okay. Big, boring game. Fair enough. It seems the way. Uh, Seb, thanks Which very Pep much for coming also today. Really badly overthink, by the way. You know, and, yes. and we'll talk about that. And you know, almost certainly, Riyad Mahrez will play goal. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, thanks to you for your attendance. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, of course, to Matt Slater for uh, giving us his time this week, uh, and to producer Adonis as usual for all of his uh, support and uh, heavy editing. And we'll be back uh, on Tuesday with uh, something very, very game-relevant of all about the weekend. And Alex will be back by then, too. Well, hey! Uh, so, see all you typos there. Au revoir! Athletic.